Uh, we're going to be uh, opening up the floor to any questions that people have. So feel free to um, ask the questions that you've long had or um, that have come up for you today. Um, and we'll go, go ahead and get started. Thank you, ladies, for all your knowledge. You were inspiration today, for sure. Um, what is, in your opinion, the most effective way for beginners with a dedicated AAC device to get the child's inner circle, if you will, familiarized with modeling and use of the device? Just because we have such a large extended family, I'd like to, I don't know if I should hold a little mini class for them, if you will. Any opinions on that? You go. Um, I think that's a really good idea, actually. Um, I don't know what your device is, but there's um, a website called Interactive Speech Pathology. It's a speech pathologist in Perth, and she has some example like focus sheets of a sheet per week. Um, I use them a lot with teams where I will email it out to everybody and then we get together maybe once, a four, once every two weeks um, where we will talk about the content of the sheet and we practice that. Um, obviously it's best if people can have a copy of the vocabulary to practice with, which isn't always doable in a large family, but I guess if you've got a system on an iPad and you can install the app on a few iPads and, and make sure people have access to it to practice, that's also really helpful. Interactive speech pathology, Yvette Theodorson. Um, the other thing, Jen, that you could do is take a screenshot of the home page, print it out and laminate it and give it to everyone. Stick it on their fridge, make it into a fridge magnet. Um, talk to them about why you're doing this. We have found a lot of families benefit from sharing their vision. So if you sit down and you say, okay, what's, what's my vision for my child's future? What's my vision for their adult life? I want him to have some kind of contribution to our community, whether that's paid employment, volunteer employment. I want him to have friends. I want him to have choice and control over his life. I want him to be able to communicate with a whole range of people. All right. The whole family, this is our goal. This is what we are working towards. What are the steps that we're going to need to get there? Guess what? Everyone's got to get on board with his language system. And it doesn't mean that we're no longer listening to his signs, to his vocalisations, to when he brings you something. It simply means that we're adding this to his repertoire. But I think getting everyone on the same page of why you're actually doing this um, and send give them videos on YouTube, send them videos in a family, like in a WhatsApp um, chat group of videos of him using it. So they're kind of getting a bit of, oh, okay, well, this kid's actually doing this, you know, this woman's not crazy. Um, so, you know, cause some, yeah. But video, and that it really helps um, professionals sometimes get on board as well, seeing shared videos. Yeah. So you've got that shared understanding of why we're doing this shared understanding of the steps that are going to take us to get there um, and you're sending them little g up look what we're doing along the way does that sound good okay that's all right the question up the very back hi sorry i have a 16 month old son and i was just wondering the the whole limiting screen time for younger kids and things like that should we be starting with a low-tech option or should we give him access to the high-tech option from a young age you can do it. both <laughs> yes <laughs> totally um every child needs both you need low-tech for when you're in the bath and when you're going out and it's going to be raining and you need high tech so that you can call out and get people's attention and later on presenting class and, and you need both. And so I would make sure that you have both, model both. Um, it sounds like a lot. If you need to pick one, I probably would start with low tech. Mm -hmm. um, just generally because people find it easier to model with low tech. One of the um, studies that we did a few years back that we haven't published, 
but we looked at the amount of modelling that people did with low tech versus high tech and we found it was considerably more with low tech because people were less worried about it being broken and so it was more likely to be right there in the middle of the mix of whatever you were doing. Um, but realistically, we want every individual to have both. And then low tech is there when it breaks down or it, yeah. Corey? Oh, there's a gentleman at the back. Yeah, I've just got a scenario I'd like to um, pitch to you and, and um, get your advice. Uh, often um, my son uh, will be relatively obvious to us what he wants. It might be something on a bench. He might utter a vocalisation, yet he may be ca uh, capable of actually um, verbalising what it is. So he might say, might, he might be able to say the word car for car, and it's clear there's a toy car on a bench that he wants. Um, but he's just, before saying that word, he may have just sort of whinged a little bit uh, for that object. Um, I'm just wondering the balance sometimes to strike when you want to encourage a child to vocalise that word because you know they know it. Um, you want to encourage them sometimes to use an AAC device to actually say car. You also want to extend them to say you want car. And then obviously the balance point from frustrating the living hell out of the child by making them say one or multiple of those pathways to teach them um, to just making that available to them. I'm just interested in your thoughts on how to strike the balance when teaching you know, those skills and then stretching them on um, the use of a word and then introducing prepositions and, and verbs in that way. You go first. <laughs> She's going to make me go first all, all yep. day. I defer to you. Oh, so. Really? Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there's a few things in there. Number one, I think you have to play it on the day by his general you know, if you think it's going to cause a major meltdown to, to push it a little bit further, I tend to not push it. What I would, <coughs> what I would do is model for him how he could have said that in a more formal way when he's doing the uh, uh, uh. Um, you know him the best. You might know that one day you can wait a bit longer and you're going to get the word car. If you get the word car, then you would do what's called an expansion, and you'd po probably do that with AAC, so you would do I want car. Um, so do a lot of modelling in there as well, taking those opportunities where they've just communicated, and they've communicated at one level to model the next level is some of the best language learning, whether it's with speech or sign or um, picture symbols. Um, and so all of that expansion um, research has been done with verbal kids and with AAC. And so it's a wonderful opportunity to just model the next level. I would never force him to do the next level. Um, the bit with the vocalisation versus the language, I would probably judge that on the day and how he's feeling and, and you know him best. Is it going to cause a major meltdown if you you know, wait that little bit longer? Because it sounds like you're not forcing him, you're just waiting a bit longer and then he goes to the next here so you can make a decision on the day about whether you're going to wait or not because you know him the best of everybody. Yes, I don't have anything to add. Okay, good. Um, in terms of, or well, maybe I do have something to add, um, <laughs> in, in terms of explaining it to the staff that are working with him, we use the term match and stretch. So you're matching the word oh, you want car, I want car, and stretching it. So that sometimes helps them remember. <coughs> um, so if they say ball, oh, it's a blue ball. So you're matching it and repeating that word and just stretching it out one more. Um, they are finished now. Um, so I wanted to ask a question to you about uh, light tech and high tech. So Lily Grace has an integrated system. So she's got her talker with pod on it and then her pod book, and we've had the pod book for many, many years now, different books, um, and the talker probably for, gosh, I'm not sure, three or four years that we've been using it, modeling with Fidelity, and she really, gosh, maybe for the last six months or even longer, the book is always there, talkers are always there, and when I model with the book, she shuts it on me. She's just like, done. So. I'm starting to feel a bit disrespectful of what, um, what I feel like she's telling me to keep sort of 
to model with the book or try to engage with the book, even though she also, we have a talker there. And so I'm just curious, like, I'm just not sure what to do with that because it is feeling like she's being pretty clear and we could have the, the light tech in the backpack so we still have it as a backup, but really focus our modeling where she seems to be the most engaged. I'm just curious what you all think about that. So because I had dinner with you last Friday night <laughs> and I chatted a lot with Lily Grace, I did notice that you were always using high-tech AAC to model with her, but that could have been because I was monopolising her book. And you did comment on how well she was going with me modelling with the book. So she had no issue with me modelling with the book and then I would switch to her iPad and then I would go back to the book and she didn't mind what I did. So some of that's probably just, you know, a typical child, mother, you know, mum, get over it. <laughs> um, but she's definitely herself so much more engaged with talking with the iPad. Like that was really clear to me and, and clear to me that when she initiates, she's using so much more language than when she responds to. I would probably at that point kind of take that cue and do what you were doing and model the majority on the iPad because that's where she's interested in communicating and initiating and engaging and so feed into that. But maybe there's someone in her environment who could focus on modelling the low tech so that it stays in your toolkit because she really didn't mind me modelling on the low tech. In yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, weekly flight to San Francisco? No problem. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I don't know, is there a teacher's aide at school or someone like that who could primarily model low tech that Lily Grace would, so she still gets that input? Because, you know, they're, well, also, look, I'm just going to tell everyone about their private life now. <laughs> Yeah, don't, don't worry. No, Lily Grace's talker went flat and Corey goes to the cupboard and pulls out another two. So, yeah. <laughs> so it's not like you're going to say to yourself, we desperately have to have the low tech as a backup for when this breaks because you've got so many options. But there will still be circumstances where low tech is better. And so you want to keep that familiarity with low tech. Mm. Yeah. Your thoughts? Yeah, no, I'd just be interested in what, if her peers, and if her pe what her peers are using, if that has any influence on what she's enjoying. Do her peers seem to, like at school, do they seem to gravitate towards the iPad more? Um, I, well, I see pictures of them definitely using the book and the okay. iPad. So the book is definitely being used by peers at when they're over for playdates they seem more interested in using the talker, but they'll carry the book around everywhere. Mm. Or if we go out, a friend will grab the book and you know wear it when we're out and about. Um, and certainly her paraeducator, who's amazing, always has the book and she, she uses, that's her primary um, so AAC. That's and Lily Grace yeah. will close it on her some, but I think it's not as much as she's closing mm. it on me. Yeah. yeah. She is such a tween. <laughs> that is true, yes. Ten came on with a vengeance. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Hi. It's, am I? Um, quick question is that our daughter is 17 months old. Uh, we're newly diagnosed, so we know nothing about talkers and mapping or masking and all mm -hmm. that good stuff. Um, my question is, what is your biggest um, advice as far as getting, I mean, she's in every therapy you can think of right now, aqua, infant massage, OT, PT, and we have therapists in and out of our house all week long. Um, but speech is, we haven't been evaluated for a speech yet. And at 17 months old, I know that they'll probably come in and spend 30 minutes with her and say she's not, we wouldn't give her a device right now because she wouldn't know what to do with it. Mm -hmm. um, so my question is, is you know, what is your advice as far as that goes? Can I go first? You go first. <laughs> My biggest advice for you would be play with your daughter. Play with your daughter, take her to the parks to see the ducks. Don't become her therapist because you're her mum. Um, so keep in mind that therapy real life 
balance. Um, in terms of her language system, no, she might not be ready, but she's ready to listen and she's ready to watch. So you are the ones that actually need the communication system so that you can model that receptive input for her. So no, she probably will, won't pass any AAC evaluation, but I would be pushing for speech therapy services so that you guys can get some support so that you've got someone who can show you some options and you can have a fiddle with different AAC systems and devices. And you might be want to watch some webinars or some different systems on YouTube and see what floats your boat. There's lots of Angelman and communication pages on Facebook where we discuss all these sorts of things. So ask questions. Um, have a chat with other families about what, about what they're using, what they like about it, what they wish was different. Um, but you're the ones that are going to be teaching her this language. So at the moment, it's not actually about her, it's about you. Mm. Um. And so the, the model of AAC evaluation that is actually recommended by ASHA, the American Speech and Hearing Association, I'm assuming you're American, mm. is what's called the participation model. And it was written up by Miranda and Buchelman and it's referred to um, by a number of policy documents, including one from the United Nations. And what it says is that every individual has the right to access the same vocabulary as their typically developing peers. That's one thing it says. The other thing it talks about is a system for today and a system for tomorrow. So today, how does your daughter communicate? Facial expression, vocalisation, body language, etc. What do you want her to communicate with tomorrow? And what steps do you need to put in place to get that happening? And you never take today away from her. Today, you continue to honour that and respond to that. But what you do is you model how she could say it tomorrow. And so tomorrow is going to be some form of AAC system, preferably some form of comprehensive AAC system and you just need to decide which one that is because the only way she's going to get to tomorrow is by you modelling it, as Mary Louise said. So our role is to put language in so that we can get language out later. We're making lots of language deposits, just as we do with babies when we talk to them. We talk, 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 and they start talking. It's the same process. So you are going to model AAC so that she can learn how to do it later on. And you are going to, as Mary Louise said, be a critical part of picking what that system is, um, whichever one you model. But at the moment, it's about recognising and honouring her system for today and figuring out the steps you need for tomorrow. And that's what a good AAC assessment would involve. That's actually the process that's written up and recognised by ASHA. So that's what it should involve. Doesn't mean it always does, but that's what it should involve. So um, when you have an evaluation, if you have an evaluation, it's going to be sitting down and talk, or it should be sitting down and talking about what do you want for her tomorrow? You want her to be able to give opinions, make requests, comment, etc. And so you're going to need to model all of those for her to learn how to do it. Um, I would totally agree, of course, with everything Mary Louise said. <laughs> um, but yeah, I would agree. Chat to other Angelman parents, look at some of the recorded webinars. Um, there's some on Prolite Quite A Go, there's some on Pod, there's some on other systems. Have a look at them and then try and get your hands on a system and, and just start practicing and using. Good day. Um, so we're from Ireland. Um, we have a baby called Leo who was diagnosed in July. So he's 16 months old now. So my question was, there's only about 300 people in Ireland with Angelman. So if we were to look at all of Leo's therapists, only one of them's ever met a child with Angelman syndrome. So this AAC and the stuff you're talking about, mo most of them may not have a lot of experience or any. So I just wondered how, what advice you'd give to getting doctors and therapists on board with 
doing this kind of stuff when they have no experience? So they really don't need to understand Angelman versus anything else. What they need to understand is what is good practice in alternative or augmentative communication. And good practice is parents and family members and teachers modelling a system for tomorrow, like Jane was talking about. So we can help them, you can help them, you're going to be the experts in Angelman, so you can help them fill in the gaps on Angelman. What you're needing from them is their expertise in language um, and uh, alternative and augmentative communication. So I wouldn't be too concerned about finding an Angelman specialist because the child with Angelman that they might have met 10 years ago might be very, very different to Leo. So you want, you're going to be the expert on Leo, the expert on Leo's version of Angelman, and what you need support with is the communication. Um, you might get a lot of success um, and buy-in from supporting your therapist to access Angelman UK's resources. Jane and I both did workshops for Angelman UK that were filmed, and they should be up on their new website. Um, Angelman UK has a really good relationship with um, the UK pod trainers, the um, Pro Loco to Go organisation. They do a lot of training. Um, Angelman UK have put out a booklet, I Have Something to Say, which talks about the communication impairment in Angelman. So I would tie in, talk to Sarah and Sarah in Ireland about tying in with the um, Angelman UK and their resources because that's probably going to be your best bet in supporting your therapist to understand how to put an Angelman spin on it, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, Mary Louise and I both, um, and there were other speakers as well, did a day for professionals in the UK working with um, individuals with Angelman syndrome, and that's what was recorded. Mm. So it's like a what's good practice in AAC and um, what we know about Angelman syndrome, what's worked. So they would be a good set of starting videos. Yeah. And they should be up on the new website. I'll, I'll email Rachel and um, one of the trustees of Angelman UK and I'll ask her what the situation yep. is and then I'll put it up in the Fast Gala Weekend site if you want. Um, the, the group on Facebook, Angelman Literacy <coughs> and Communication, is open to um, everyone, not just the Angelman community, but it started for the AS community, but it's open to professionals and family members, teachers, educators, speech therapists, and there's a lot of resources in the file section. There's a lot of really great discussion about what is good practice for um, children with Angelman in terms of literacy and communication. So they're more than welcome to join that group. And even if they just want to stalk and read, um, there's some great videos, photos, and lots of families sharing the ideas of what's worked for them along the journey. So more than welcome to join that group. Oh, Kate Ahern also has a group on Facebook called AAC Through Motivate, Model and Move Out of the Way. And that's a beautiful group for families and professionals. And also keep in mind that um, Siobhan's Angelman Academy will have um, uh, webinars up soon and they will be available for uh, families and uh, professionals as well. So we're working towards hitting this on all angles, um, but first port of call for you would be Angelman UK. Yeah. Hi, I have two kind of unrelated questions. And um, the first is it seems like you guys are anti hand over hand to try to get him to press a specific button on a talker. Mm -hmm. I have a 20 month old. We have seen glimpses that he can isolate his pointer finger. Um, and the, the therapists all want to do hand over hand, and I keep fighting them and just wanted to get y'all's. Sorry, did on my it. face give it away? <laughs> yes. Yes, yes. I it think did. I was You're... less subtle. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no hand over hand, right? I can bear, I, I don't see that well. Yep. Okay, okay. great. I mean, if everybody um, in this room took the hand of the person next to them, and had an ISC system in front of them, you could make them say anything. Right. And you're not learning anything from doing that. It, it doesn't, there is no research to say that it works. I appreciate that, that's super helpful. Thank yeah. you. And I think we need to remember that the kids learn when their motivation mm -hmm. and their intent to communicate that thing is 
is driven from in them. Yeah. So it's, okay, I, I really want more of that and it's over there and mum's over there, so what am I gonna do? I've shouted out to her, that hasn't worked. I know if I hit that more symbol, so I'm gonna get my hand to do that. I'm gonna hit more um, and woohoo, it gets a reaction. So it's gotta have all that internal drive because mm -hmm. remember for the kids, all the planets have to align for that dyspraxia to be overridden and to get their hand to do what they want. Um, you know, we're, we were talking about it this morning in the um, early years talk, but so many times when people are doing hand over hand, they're holding the kid's hand here. And for our little people who have very limited body awareness, they don't know their fingers pointing out here. So actually we need to hold this part and wake up this finger and say, oh, gonna get this finger woken mm. up so we can use it. Oh, squeeze, squeeze, squeeze. Now we can touch it. Cause the kid's yeah. like, oh, that's what the finger is. That's why I'm doing it. Yeah. But for a 20 month old, I wouldn't be concerned they're not doing finger isolation. I would be looking at a whole hand, a whole fist or a raking motion and taking that as being their, their access method at this point. And maybe by the time he's five, we're working on a point. But at 20 months old, I would just be great if he's banging on that AAC and we're responding to it. He's babbling. Great. Yep. Um, and we're attributing meaning and assuming competence and teaching him that he is a communicator. Yes. Super helpful, thank you. Um, so the next question is about sign language. I haven't seen much about that in this presentation. Our son has about five signs. Yep. So I am feverishly learning sign language. What ability of sign language have you seen? How, I mean, do we need to go take sign language classes in order to model it for him? How much sign language do we need to be learning now? Uh, so the issues with sign language in the Angelman community are a lot of the children don't have the fine motor or the gross motor to make the correct sign. So it ends up being their own version of the sign. Idiosyncratic. Yeah. yeah. Um, that they often don't have a range of communication partners that can understand all their signs. That um, people in the school, I mean, you go to any Angelman conference and young people will come up to you and start signing and there are no signs that anyone can recognise, but that young person thinks that you should know what it is. Um, so it's, it's really clear that absolutely, as a quick way of getting my needs met in my family or my school or my tight circle of friends, then I need to have some signs. Because I'm gonna use what's easiest for me. If I can grunt, if I can point, if I can reach, if I can grab, if I can take you, if I can sign more, that's wonderful. But I need a whole language system that everyone else is gonna understand because I want that kid's world to be so fantastic and so big and that he can talk to absolutely anyone he wants to talk to. Um, and unless you're in the deaf community, then sign's not going to be your community. So I'd just be really mindful of making sure he also has access to a symbolic system of AAC. Um, and for our children who use sign and who go into respite centres, who go into schools or new daycares, we always do like a sign dictionary because often people will say, oh, he does this, what does this mean? It's like, well, technically it means that, but for him it means this. Mm -hmm. And some of our um, young people will have one sign that has 10 multiple meanings, depending on the day or who he's saying it to. So it, it becomes sort of bigger than Ben-Hur. Yes, it's great to have some signs, but you're never gonna have the grammar the, I mean, if you look at sign language, not Makaton, not keyword sign, but so any sign language, the placement of the signs is so important. The grammar, it has its own grammar, its own language structure. Um, sign language is so beautiful. So you've got to be really careful that if your child doesn't have the dexterity to do all that placement of signs, to give the grammar, to give the meaning, to give the to understand what it is to be a communication partner in a signed interaction, then we also need another symbolic system. Does that make sense? Oh, definitely. We are modeling yep. for Loco to go. We yep. absolutely know that. I guess signing yep. for us right now is our low tech version and yep. the yep. bathtub. I mean. I can't get the Proloco out to go 
when I'm changing his diaper. You know, okay. so no, it's true. Been and that's where I would take a screenshot of the homepage we, of Prolote Quota Go we, and have that laminated in 20 places around we, the house. We have that. We just okay. don't use it as okay. much as I, it's hard. Um, okay, yeah. it's, it's awesome in theory, but for at least for us, it's been hard to change the diaper and point to the thing. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah. So I guess, so y'all are sort of anti-sign language and we shouldn't. So the, the research shows that sign language significantly improves receptive language. The same research also says so does modelling with symbols. Um, I don't know about specific research with Angelman syndrome and sign, signing and long-term outcomes, but in the autism research, they found a lot of people learn 20 to 50 signs. They're often highly, highly idiosyncratic, and so they're not accepted within the sign community. And they are one of the most abandoned systems when individuals leave school because nobody in the wider community understands them. Okay. And so they're all the things to think about with signing. It will improve receptive language. It's a great quick thing for certain situations. Um, as Mary Louise has already said, people tend to learn a small group of them, don't tend to learn all the language and grammar, um, off generally, well, often not accepted by the deaf community and don't have enough language. So I would agree, um, it becomes a system that you use quickly within the family and your close friends to get a message across, and then you need something more robust for the rest of the time and for all the other language. Um, and when they say the research says that it improves receptive language significantly, it's a lot of signing. Um, and what I tend to find is people do a signing course and then use 10 of them. Um, I don't know about other people who've done signing courses, but that's what I say all the time. Mm. Yeah. Okay, that's all. No, I, I definitely think that receptively it has helped him. He yeah. understands milk better when I do this than yep. when I just say the word. Yep. But I, this is very helpful. Thank you guys so yep. much. It's much less fleeting than speech. And so therefore it's more concrete. So it does help. Yeah. Thank you. And that's why the children with receptive language issues need us to be modeling on a comprehensive language system because they're not processing speech or they're not processing speech at the speed they need to in order to understand. So for us using the symbols and holding our finger on the symbol, it's giving them that time to process it. So like um, earlier on today when we were talking about our people with Angelman who have receptive language issues, they are the students that need the most comprehensive language systems because we need to model everything visually because they're not understanding any speech or very little speech. I know there's questions up around there somewhere. I don't know where the microphone is. Yeah. Oh, cool. <laughs> um, so I guess I have a question. It's kind of like a mix between inclusion in AAC, so I don't know if it's appropriate for right now, but any feedback would be helpful. Um, recently, my daughter, who's in preschool, they've um, taken her SLP sessions and put them in inclusion, and she seems to have like thrived off of that and has done a lot better with her touch chat. Um, so do you guys have any feedback or tips on, I'm trying to push inclusion, and for some reason the school is saying, like they don't really give her that much. I want to say as she goes through elementary school, she's maybe going to get 20 minutes a day. And I would love for her to have more because she's the communication part is coming back on like her behaviors are better and because now she can communicate. So I don't know if you guys have tips on what I can say for the school to give me more inclusion because she's doing so well with AAC. Um, I would listen to the session that the wonderful ladies did this morning on inclusion okay. and watch yes. the recording of that. There were so many good tips and hints and yeah, it was fabulous. Right, they are yeah. awesome. Yes. <laughs> watch that system and also ask the principal of the school, what does your student have to prove before she's given a whole day? I ask him, you know, and where's the research behind what he's saying? Mm. Um, push it back on them. Like, what really does she have to prove? What are the prerequisites to being in a classroom? Because nobody else, nobody else had a prerequisite. Um, but talk to, listen to the girls this morning, the women, sorry. Um, sorry, ladies. 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 <laughs> um, and have a chat with Cor Corey and Kelly. Can you just stand up so that lady knows what you look like? This is Corey and Kelly. 
who presented this morning. So find them and have a deep and meaningful with them um, and watch the show. Yeah. They are shit hot. <laughs> <laughs> Language warning me. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, I'm uh, David from San Francisco. I have a 10 year old named Josh. Hi, Corey. Um, and uh, with resp in response to the question about inclusion, one of the things that we've been doing um, to have Josh more included with AAC is we have a second iPad with Proloquo in his general education classroom. And it's one of the rewards for the students who are doing well in the general education classroom that if they, it, that they get to use the iPad with Josh to communicate mm. during the, the classroom sessions. And it's really been, he's not gonna wanna just communicate with an AAC device if he's the only one in the classroom. And so that's yeah. been really, really useful. Um, and it's been good for the other students as well to see that there's other ways to communicate and learn um, in addition to just the verbal mechanisms. And in terms of sign language, that's something that we really looked at early on um, when Josh was diagnosed. And what we found was he would struggle to learn the the classical sign language, the American Sign Language signs, he just didn't have, as you pointed out, the manual dexterity or the motor skills, but he was very eager to use signs. And so we just developed, as you said, an idiosyncratic sort of much more um, kind of generic symbol, signals, like that he'll tap his butt when he needs to potty or tap his arm when he wants to change the channel on TV or something and, and use those. And it's the, it's the multimodality, it's the ability to do that in combination with gestures and eye contact and mm -hmm. utterances and also have the ability to point to a PEC deck that is what gives him the ability to communicate. So we haven't focused on learning any like specific sign language, it's more creating the language that works for him and then sharing it with his communication partners that's worked for us. Thank you. I'm another David because we just want to have patterns here. Yeah. Um, so we have a seven-year-old named Nico who is a AAC user and fully included in his first grade classroom. And we are very conscious of the relationship between modeling uh, with fidelity and his enthusiasm for initiating communication on his AAC device. And so I'm curious about your recommendations in terms of best practices on measuring and logging or paying attention to the amount that's happening both at home and at school. Um, uh, just to give an example, I know a dad in our area with a AAC system who every single week extracts the data and sends a report to school saying, this is what's happening in your classroom. You know, here's the data from the system. You know, this is what I'm noticing in the patterns. That seems like a lot of work. Um, but I'm curious about sort of what you found the most helpful with teams that may have the best intentions but need support to notice patterns and improve the amount of modeling that, that uh, students are being exposed to. I think it, it heavily depends on the team. Because you might have a teacher who's really data driven and who just loves getting that data every week. You could have a teacher who is really freaked out by that data. Sees it as a threat. Yeah, yeah and who, who sees that as a threat to her competence as a teacher. So I think it's heavily dependent on the skill level of the team, the relationship you've got with the team, and we want teams to be reflective practitioners we want and we want to create this motivation for them to learn more about it so what I tend to do is focus on a skill for two weeks okay this two weeks we're going to focus on commenting and we're going to like this is where you find all the language we're going to be doing it at home we're going to go gangbusters on commenting during book time during meal time during playtime and developing that fluency with the um, teachers. And then we start looking at what Nico's saying. We, then we can look at the data and say, hey, you guys, you've been working on commenting and oh my gosh, Nico said the word like 47 times this week. And that's, a, you know, that's directly because you've been doing this. And then they can see, oh, okay, well, it is worth me doing it. And you help them eat the elephant in tiny bites. But it really depends on the team and what drives them and 
what capacity they're at to take things on board at the moment. And I would agree strongly, as I said to the first question, having like a focus of the fortnight, whether it's for a family or a school team, any group that you're trying to get using AAC more, I've found that's much more effective than, um, yeah, language sampling or some school systems insist on that constant data collection. I would be more inclined to have like a simple check form that you use after shared reading with these are the elements of crowd we did today or these are the other things we did and, and focus on an activity and a pathway for a couple of weeks and then another activity and another pathway for a couple of weeks and constantly keep it fresh and new by giving them an, a new goal. That sounds like a lot of work too. Mm. That's possibly what you're thinking. I don't know what system you're... Um, speak for yourself. Speak for yourself. So um, maybe talk to the ladies that speak for yourself. I know, for example, with Prolote Quota Go, that they have their core word classroom with um, suggested activities for the week that people can access and print off and use, and they have checklists and sheets for checking modelling. Um, for POD, that's been developed by different people um, around the world. So yeah, I don't know what there is for Speak for Yourself, but yeah, I would check into that, see what is already out there that can save you all that work. Mm. Yeah. Hi, um, I'm uh, Eve. I have a daughter, Vivian, who's four years old, um, and she's been using Perloquo for about two years. Um, so she's at the place where she has uh, preferred folders. Mm -hmm. um, so even if we model robust vocabulary all over the talker, she goes back to her family. She talks about her sister if she's initiating. She talks about Elmo if she's initiating. Um, and we can get stuck in mm -hmm. Lucia, Lucia, Elmo, you know, and um, we're really lucky to have our speech therapist with us here today mm -hmm. um, who's been doing amazing work in stretching that. But we're just curious to hear if you have other ideas about how to move her out of those preferred places um, when that's, if, if, in, if given the opportunity to initiate, that's where she goes back to. Mm -hmm. You go. Yeah, you go. Um, I would do, be doing lots of stories about her interests. So you're writing books about Lucia, you're writing books about Elmo, and you're using other key vocab in there that you can model. So she's still getting the hit of, there's my people, there's my things but she's learning other language to talk about. So when you're going, when she's saying Lucia, Lucia, you can say, oh, maybe you want to read the book, maybe you want to go, um, and trying to map out what her communicative intent is. If Is it just, I want to talk about Lucia? Is it, I want to go and be with her? Am I requesting her? Am I telling you a story about her? Um, so trying to show her all those different things you can do to talk about Lucia, but having the, the printed out Pictello books about Lucia, having all the little Elmo stories, um, stick photos of her in an adventure with Elmo so that she's getting that fix and then she can talk about other things. Have her talker where she can say, Lucia, 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 and you're saying, oh, yes, on a different talker or on a, um, a laminated screenshot, oh, Lucia, go, yes, Lucia, go to school. Oh, we will go and get her later. If she doesn't want to share or you want to take her off topic, sometimes having the two devices can help, but we've found especially with um, children with Angelman who are obsessed with their people, having photo albums, having books about them, where there's lots of topics of discussion throughout that book and where they can initiate a discussion about that person by sitting with you and sharing that book. And you can talk about the special places you go and the special things you do. And then we start to see things like Lucia Park, Park, Park. Oh yes, let's have a look in the book. Lucia went to the park. Maybe we'll go later. Does that sound like something you can do? Else? Thanks very much. Um, my question is, we have a six-year-old. She's had her, she has a Nova Chat. She's had it for two and a half years now. Um, she is very cognitively able to use it. Mm -hmm. Extremely unmotivated to use it. Which page set do you have? Um, right now we're on the 42, uh, Word power, for yep. basic, word power 42 basic. Yep. Um, 
And what I see happen with her SLP, who is not as knowledgeable of AAC at times, I feel, that when we see lack of motivation for using the device, well, I think we need to go back down to 20. Mm. And I'm going, this is not. Sometimes it's actually better to go up. <laughs> and, and, and we actually, a year ago, had a specialist come in who actually recommended that we go from the 20 up to the 42, yeah. which is how we got to where we're at. Yeah. But with our daughter, she very much seems, as soon as we make some sort of big change, it's interesting for her to again. Mm. Oh, I want to, and we'll, she'll be super interested in using it for a while and then not so interested yep. anymore. Yep. Or very interested in using a couple buttons depending on set setting. At home, she loves to tell us she wants to watch her iPad or watch Netflix or pick the show she wants to watch. Yep. And in therapy, she'll say done. And then she pushes everything out of the way and she's done. Mm -hmm. um, and what sort of therapy is it, sorry? Because what, uh, what, what I've, um, I guess what I'm trying to say is, I, um, I would never pull a child out to do AAC therapy as a speech language pathologist. I tend to go to where they are and we do the language as part of what they're doing. But I do know other therapists who pull the kids out and I think that's when often, well, my um, observation would be that then they're often doing tasks not for real reasons and they're doing more drill and practice tasks and then the kids aren't as engaged with that. So I don't know if that's a factor. And, and I, I think that is a factor with her, but I also think it plays over in everything. Right. At home, we're seeing her unmotivated to use it. Um, at school, they say, well, she, they've told, you know, kind of said, well, she can use it for two things. And she can't, and I said, well, if she can use it consistently for two things, and she's using it for the two things you guys are saying, the two things we see, and two things we see it there. She can use that device. She mm -hmm. knows that device. I can change where the buttons are, and she knows where to, mm -hmm. how to find them. She understands what it's doing. She's just not, to, be, to me, okay. I'm seeing she's not motivated to do it. Yeah. So the recommendations on how to continue with that. Mm -hmm. um, do you have a, like an AAC network in your neighborhood? anything like that. I guess um, th earlier this year I ran an AAC camp and we had some students come on the camp who exactly, you know, were described like that. Meeting other people who use AAC really gave them a buzz and they're using their AAC a lot more now. Um, so I guess that's been one solution that I've seen a lot over the years that has really worked to meet other people who use AAC and, and see them using it. Um, when you say the school only sees her using it just for two reasons, that's not because they're limiting it, that's just because that's all she's saying at school. That's kind of, that's the impression that we've gotten. I Is mean, that, I, that's all she's saying at school? Okay. so. Are they modeling it still? I know she's quite competent at using it, but are they modeling like two to three more words than she's saying? They say they are. Okay, <laughs> all right. Um, so I would um, perhaps at your next meeting talk about, okay, what are you using it for? What situations are you using it in? We find she really enjoys chatting about I don't know, jewellery, makeup, books, whatever she really enjoys chatting about. Could we do a little bit of role playing and just get a sense for how familiar they're feeling with the vocabulary to be modelling it? Um, I'm not saying they're not modelling it, but maybe you can talk about ways to extend what they're doing. Um, yeah. Oh, um, hold on, before you go, I'll add something to that. I think one of the things that we also struggle with with her is, is the, and this is kind of was, I, we were both going to ask a question and so I'll kind of take lump them together here is also what you guys think of the motivation to, and where you would dry the, draw the line of using the AAC device as opposed to kind of signs or signals that she's developed on her own. Because that's one of the things that we struggle with at home is, is she'll grab her cup and say, you know, I yeah. want water or I want 
we know, and so we'll say, okay, you want water. And she's just like, throws the, the device away. Like, I already told you I want water with this yeah. cup. So that, I think, might also be what's going on in school a little bit. So, like, where do we draw that line of, okay, yeah, should we be pushing her to say, I want water, or should we just be letting her go on with her cup thing? Yeah. And Communication is always multimodal. And all I would ever do in that situation is model how she could have said it with her system. So I never then ask her to say it. So if she goes wanting a drink, I would say, oh, you want a drink? Okay, and I get it for her. But I don't make her say it, I just model how she could have said it. So that she's aware when she meets someone who doesn't understand this, that she's got another option. I then might get someone in the environment to um, act dumb to pretend that they don't understand what this means. Best usually to have an unfamiliar person do it. So if you have a new carer coming in or a new worker, if you can say to them, look, we just want to use this, it's called accomplice training. So you set someone up to be accomplice to get them to use the skill. She knows that you know what that means. So there's no point you pretending you suddenly don't. So. <laughs> Well, yeah. and that's what we did when we started, when we put her in school, she's in kindergarten, and we, when we met with them, because we put them into a school that was very unfamiliar with the whole process, yep. and I was very adamant that the talker needs to be a huge part of this, because she's already developed the frustration with us of trying to get her to teach the talk. Yeah. And I think that's what they're just kind of passing over, it, which is what mom is asking about, and yeah, so we're and to find I would say that that's medium. A, yeah, that's a pattern is that I've seen a lot as people transition between settings. They go to the new setting and it, all the focus is on their AAC system and then people get to know their body language and their facial expression and all the other stuff and the importance of the AA system can slip by a little bit and it becomes, and, and communication is multimodal, so that's okay. But I guess it's giving her that, that clear understanding that not everybody's gonna understand your, your natural gestures and that we need to model how you can say that in another way and that you know there's mrs so-and-so in your environment who's really bad at understanding them and you have to use your talker with her um i i guess it, it to me it's probably a combination of things i tend to find when more modeling is happening and it's happening consistently that we don't get as much disengagement um, but that's not always the case. Sometimes kids are just disengaging with it because no one else in their environment who's an, another cool kid is using it to talk. And so that's where I've found meeting other AAC users can be really helpful. Um, I don't know if you've looked at getting her to watch videos with you on YouTube of people using AAC. That could be an option. Um, yeah, and for students who have kind of started to equate their AAC with work. Mm. Um, like if there's not a lot to talk about at school, if she's doing a lot of one-on-one -on -one work or you know, there's, there's not interesting lessons about Egypt or stories, then there's not a lot to talk about. So sometimes we have to kind of kickstart using the talker. And in a lot of families this year, probably for the last, um, whenever, since whenever it came out, we've been using Alexa. And so mm. the children um, will do, uh, you know, Alexa play and then Christmas. Oh, and so Alexa plays the songs, you know, Alexa play Jingle Bells. Um, and then we model on the talk, oh, I like that one, do that one again. Mm. And then the brother comes over and Alexa play Barney. Um, and so Alexa's booming out all their favourite tunes and it's something that they can't do with their gestures, that they can't do with their vocalisations. They need to use their talker and suddenly their talker is cool. You know, Alexa, do a fart noise and Alexa does it and that's just hysterical for so many little people. Um, so trying to change it up using something like that uh, has been wonderful for a lot of our AAC users that are just like, yeah, you know what, this thing's hard work. Yeah. And that made me think too, using peers to use, you know, peers who use the, the, your, your daughter's AAC system has also been a really successful option. So, you know, 
um, Michaela, I want you to come over here and work with so and so, and um, you know we're going to program some stuff for your little group assignment to say later to present to the class. Thinking of different ways that you can get that happening, mm. using the peers to be facilitators and supporters, has sometimes been way more successful than getting the adults to do it. Mm. Okay. Mm. Yeah. It's a yeah. 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 Um, yeah. Yeah, I would say bang on, go gangbusters in the holidays, um, like over Christmas, give her lots of things to talk about over Christmas. Maybe, Maybe buy her an Alexa if you haven't yeah. already <laughs> thought of a present. Um, <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. So, so, you know, there's plenty of videos on YouTube of kids with AAC and Facebook kids with AAC um, talking to Alexa. Um, Tina Thompson, who presented this morning, her son Finn is an Alexa whiz. Um, Alexa, Alexa plays ditties. So if you say a phrase and then tell Alexa to play it as a ditty, she'll turn that phrase into a song. So Finn will program, like just communicate a random string or communicate a sentence on his AAC and then press Alexa Diddy and she'll turn it into a song. So there's all sorts of interesting things that you can do. I think sometimes you just need something big to kickstart that, hey, this really isn't as boring as you thought it was. And perhaps that's what camp does when we've yes. seen that outcome yeah. from camp too. Yeah. Uh, we're gonna wrap up with one, uh, one final quick question. Hi, I'm Todd. We have a son, Lewis, who's about two and a half, and um, I think his first word that he actually understood was Alexa. So it's funny that Alexa's <laughs> featuring so prominently because we say Alexa, and he just like turns his head looking at Alexa. <laughs> um, but we're we're kind of trying to start to figure out what we want to do on the AAC front, and been struggling to, between having hard copy pictures and having like a core set of words that we can kind of focus on to start with. And whether we should be doing that versus getting more of an electronic device to model with, or we do both, and I'm not really sure which is the best way to kind of get started on the process. Do you have a speech therapist? Yeah, we do have a speech therapist. We actually had one private one through the school, but now we're just doing the one, the one through the school for the time being. And we've met for one, we've had one meeting with somebody who knows about AAC. And we've kind of talked to them about it, but I think they don't, they don't really have like a system that they use in the school district or prefer. And so I've kind of been advocating we need to get like a core, uh, like, a, like a hard copy where it's not the individual pictures because our son will just play with the pictures as opposed to use the pictures. Mm -hmm. And so we want something you can point to. Um, and it might be easier to do the hard copy, but at the same time, if he's using an electronic device, he gets a lot more feedback and it's much more interesting to him. So I'm not really sure if we should be using both or one to start out with. You go. It's, it's a very tricky question because um, best practice would be a robust vocabulary of some sort, so hundreds of words probably. Um, high tech and low tech would be best practice so that you've got both for different situations. Um, and it's about modelling it. Um, there are a number of robust systems that you can buy that kind of take the guesswork away from choosing the vocabulary. Um, so, you know, have a look on those same groups on Facebook that Mary Louise was talking about earlier and look at the different systems that are out there. Look at videos of people using them and look at which one you think um, looks like one that you could have a go at and, and have a go at it. That would be the mm. best. Yeah, if your speech pathologist is not prepared to give you a, a recommendation in a direction, um, that, that's how I would approach it. Right. Thank you so much, Mary Louise and Jane, for um, such helpful answers to such good questions that so many Thank of us you. have. So. It's a pleasure. Let's go get glamorous. Cheese.